He returned once again to Rome. He spent a long time in the hall of a gallery containing Gothic paintings. One of them made him stop, fascinated. It was a crucifixion. What did he see? In place of Jesus, he saw a woman who had just been crucified. Like Christ, she was wearing only a piece of white cloth wrapped around her hips. The soles of her feet were braced against a wooden plank, while executioners were, trying, were tying her ankles to the beam with strong ropes. The cross was situated at the top of a hill and was visible from far and wide. It was surrounded by a crowd of soldiers, local people, onlookers, all of whom felt their gaze and covered, all of whom watched the woman exposed to their gaze. It was the lute player. She felt their gaze and covered her breasts with her hands. On each side of her were two other crosses with a criminal tied to each. The first leaned over toward her, took her hand, pulled it away from her breast, and extended her arm in such a way that the back of her hand touched the horizontal beam of the cross. The other malefactor grasped her under, under, grasped her other hand and pulled it the same way so that both of the loot player's arms were extended. Her face continued to remain immobile. Her eyes stared into the distance. But Rubens knew that she wasn't looking into the distance but into a, a huge imaginary mirror placed before her between earth and sky. She saw her own image, the image of a woman on a cross with extended arms and bare breasts. She was exposed to the immense, shouting, bestial crowd, and along with the crowd she gazed, excited, at herself. Rubens couldn't tear his eyes away from the spectacle, and when he did so at last, he told himself this moment should be inscribed into the history of religion under the title, Rubens' Vision in Rome. This mystic moment continued to affect him until evening. He had not called the lute player for four years, <clears throat> but that day he was unable to control himself. <clears throat> he dialed her number as soon as he returned to the hotel. At the other end, he heard an unfamiliar feminine voice. He said uncertainly, may I speak to Madame blank, calling her by her husband's name. Yes, that's me, said the voice at the other end. He pronounced the lute player's first name in the woman's voice answered that the lady he was calling was dead. Dead, he gasped. Yes, Agnes died. Who was calling? I am a friend of hers. May I know your name? No, he said and hung up. When someone dies on the screen, elegic music immediately comes on, but when someone dies whom we knew in real life, we don't hear any music. There are only a very few deaths capable of shaking us deeply, two or three in a lifetime, no more. The death of a woman who was only an episode surprised and saddened Rubens, but was not able to shake him, especially as she had already departed from his life four years earlier and he had had to come to terms with it then. Though she didn't become any more absent from his life than she had been before, her death changed everything. Every time he remembered her, he was forced to imagine what had become of her body. Did they lower it into the ground in a coffin, or did they have it burned? He visualized her immobile face, observing herself in an imaginary mirror with her eyes wide open. He saw the lids of those eyes slowly closing, and suddenly the face went dead. Just because that face was so calm, the transition from life to non-life was fluent, harmonious, beautiful. But then he began to imagine what happened to the face afterward, and that was terrible. G came to see him. As usual, they launched into long, silent lovemaking, and as usual during those interminable moments, he pictured the lute player in his mind. As always, she was standing bare-breasted in front of a mirror, looking straight ahead with a fixed gaze. At that moment, Rubens thought to himself that for all he knew, she might have been dead some two or three years that her hair had already dropped off her scalp and her eyes had vanished from their sockets. He wanted to get rid of this image quickly because he knew that otherwise he would not be able to continue making love. He drove the thoughts of the lute player from his mind and forced himself to concentrate on G, on her quickened breathing. 
But his mind was disobedient and spitefully fed him images he didn't want to see. And when at last his mind was ready to obey him and stopped showing him the lute player in her coffin, it showed her in flames, just as, as he had once heard it described. The burning body, through some physical force that he didn't understand, raised itself so that the lute player sat up in the furnace. In the furnace. And in the midst of this vision of a sitting, burning body, he suddenly heard a dissatisfied, urging voice. Harder, harder, more, more. He had to stop the lovemaking. He excused himself to G, saying that he was in bad shape. Then he told himself, After everything I've lived through, all I have left is a single photograph. It seems to contain whatever was most intimate and deeply concealed in my erotic life. It's, it's very essence. Perhaps I only made love in recent years so as to make that photograph come to life in my mind, and now that photograph is in flames and the beautiful, immobile face is twisting, shrinking, turning black, and falling at last into ashes. G was supposed to visit him again in a week, and Rubens was afraid in advance of the images that would trouble him during lovemaking. Wanting to get the lute player off his mind, he sat down at the table once again, his head resting on his palm, and searched his memory for other photographs remaining from his erotic life that might help him replace the image of the lute player. He managed to find a few and was happily surprised that they were still so beautiful and exciting, but in the depths of his soul he was certain that once he started making love to G, his memory would refuse to show them to him and would substitute for them, in the way of a bad macabre joke, the image of the lute player sitting in the flames. He was not wrong. Once again, he had to excuse himself in the middle of lovemaking. Then he told himself that there would be no harm in taking a brief pause in his relations with women. Until next time, as they say. But this pause kept getting longer week by week, month by month. One day he realized that there would be no next time. Part 7, The Celebration. In the health club, the movement of arms and legs has for many years been reflected by mirrors. Six months ago, at the insistence of the Imagilogues, mirrors even invaded the swimming pool. We became surrounded by mirrors on three sides, with the fourth side consisting of a single huge window looking out on the roofs of Paris. We sat in our swimming trunks at a table by the edge of the pool, which was full of swimmers puffing and blowing up and down. A bottle of wine, which I had ordered to celebrate an anniversary, stood in the middle of the table. Avenarius didn't even bother to ask me what I was celebrating because he was struck by a new idea. Imagine that you are given the choice of two possibilities. To spend a night of love with a world-famous beauty, let's say Bridget Bardot or Greta Garbo, but on condition that nobody must know about it. Or to stroll down the main avenue of the city with your arm wrapped intimately around her shoulder, but on condition that you must never sleep with her. I'd love to know exactly what percentage of people would choose the one or the other of these possibilities. That would require statistical analysis. I therefore approached several companies conducting public opinion polls, but all of them turned me down. I can never quite understand to what extent one should take your project seriously. Everything I do should be taken absolutely seriously, I continued. For example, I try to imagine you lecturing ecologists about your plan to destroy cars. Surely you didn't expect them to approve it. I paused. Avenarius kept silent. Or did you by any chance think they would burst into applause? No, said Avenarius, I didn't. Then why did you make the proposal? In order to unmask them? To prove to them that in spite of all their nonconformist gesticulations, they are, in reality, a part of what you call diabolum? There is nothing more useless, Avenarius said, than trying to prove something to idiots. Then there is only one explanation. You wanted to have some fun. But even in that case, your behavior seems illogical to me. Surely you didn't expect that any of them would understand you and laugh. 
Avenirius shook his head and said rather sadly, No, I didn't expect that. Diabolum is characterized by the total lack of a sense of humor. The comical, even if it still exists, has become invisible. Joking no longer makes sense. Then he added, This world takes everything seriously, even me. And that's the limit. I should rather think that nobody takes anything seriously. They all just want to amuse themselves. That comes to the same thing. When that complete ass is forced to announce on his news program that an atomic war has broken out or that Paris has been devastated by an earthquake, he will certainly try to be amusing. Perhaps he is already preparing some witticisms for such occasions. But this has nothing to do with the sense of the comic. Because whoever is comical in such a case is someone looking for a witticism to announce an earthquake. And someone looking for a witticism to announce an earthquake takes his activity absolutely seriously and it would never occur to him that he's being comical. Humor can only exist when people are still capable of recognizing some border between the important and the unimportant. And nowadays this border has become unrecognizable. I know my friend well, and I often amuse myself by imitating his way of talking and by adopting his thoughts and ideas, and yet there is something about him that always eludes me. I like the way he acts, it attracts me, but I cannot say that I fully understand him. Some time ago I explained to him that the essence of an individual can only be expressed by means of metaphor, by the revealing lightning of a metaphor. But as long as I've known him, I have never been able to find a metaphor that would explain Avenarius and let me understand him. Well, if it wasn't for the sake of fun, why did you submit that plan? Why? Before he could answer me, a surprised shout interrupted us. Professor Avenarius, is it possible? An attractive man in swimming trunks between 50 and 60 was walking toward us from the entrance. Avenarius rose to his feet. Both men seemed moved and kept shaking hands for a long time. Then Avenarius introduced us. I realized that I was standing face to face with Paul. He joined us at the table, and Avenarius made a broad gesture in my direction. You don't know his novels, Life is Elsewhere? You've got to read it. My wife claims that it's outstanding. I realized with sudden clarity that Avenarius had never read my novel. When he urged me some time ago to bring him a copy, it was only because his insomniac wife needed to consume mountains of books in bed. It made me sad. It made me sad. I just came to sober up in the water, said Paul. Then he saw the wine on the table and at once forgot about the water. What are you drinking? He picked up the bottle and carefully examined the label. Then he added, today I've been drinking since morning. Yes, it showed and I was surprised. I had never imagined him as a drunk. I called to the waiter to bring us another glass. We started to talk about all sorts of things. Avenarius referred a few more times to my novels, which he had not read and so provoked Paul to make a remark whose rudeness astonished me. I don't read novels. Memoirs are much more amusing and instructive for me. Or biographies. Recently I've, read, I've been reading books about Salinger, Rodin, and the loves of Franz Kafka. And a marvelous biography of Hemingway. What a fraud. What a liar. What a megalomaniac. Paul laughed happily. What an impotent. What a sadist. What a macho. What an erotomaniac. What a misogynist. If you're ready as a lawyer to defend even murderers, why don't you come to the defense of writers who have committed no wrong except for writing books, I asked. Because they get on my nerves, Paul retorted cheerfully and poured some wine into the glass the waiter had just placed before him. My wife adores Mahler, he continued. She told me that two weeks before the premiere of his Seventh Symphony, he locked himself up in a noisy hotel room and spent the whole night rewriting the orchestration. Yes, I agreed. It was in Prague in 1906. The name of the hotel was the Blue Star. 
I visualize him sitting in the hotel room surrounded by manuscript paper, Paul continued, refusing to let himself be interrupted. He was convinced that his whole work would be ruined if the melody were played by a clarinet instead of an oboe during the second movement. That's precisely so, I said, thinking of my novel. Paul continued, I wish that someday this symphony could be played before an audience consisting of the best musical experts. First with the corrections made in those last two weeks and then without the corrections. I guarantee that nobody would be able to tell one version from the other. Don't get me wrong, it is certainly remarkable that the motif played in the second movement by the violin is picked up in the last movement by the flute. Everything is worked through, thought through, felt through. Nothing has been left to chance, but that enormous perfection overwhelms us. It surpasses the capacity of our memory, our ability to concentrate, so that even the most fanatically attentive listener will grasp no more than one hundredth of the symphony. And certainly it will be this one hundredth that Mahler cared about the least. His idea, so obviously correct, cheered him up, whereas I was becoming sadder and sadder. If a reader skips a single sentence of my novel, he won't be able to understand it. And yet, where in the world where you, will you find a reader who never skips a line? Am I not myself the greatest skipper of lines and pages? I don't deny those symphonies their perfection, continued Paul. I only deny the importance of that perfection. Those super sublime symphonies are nothing but cathedrals of the useless. They are inaccessible to man. They are inhuman. We exaggerated their significance. They made us feel inferior. Europe reduced Europe to 50 works of genius that it never understood. Just think of this outrageous inequality. Millions of Europeans signifying nothing against 50 names signifying everything. Class inequality is but an insignificant shortcoming compared to this insulting metaphysical inequality, which turns some into grains of sand while endowing others with the meaning of being. The bottle was empty. I called the waiter to bring us another. This caused Paul to lose the thread. You spoke about biographies, I prompted him. Ah, yes, he recalled. You are happy that you can at last read the intimate correspondence of the dead? I know, I know, said Paul as if he wanted to counter in advance any objections from the other side. I assure you that rifling through someone's intimate correspondence, interrogating his former mistresses, talking doctors into betraying professional confidences, that's rotten. Authors of biographies are riffraff, and I would never sit at the same table with them as I do with you. Robespierre, too, would never have sat down with the riffraff that had collective orgasms at the spectacle of public executions. But he knew that he couldn't do without them. The riffraff is an instrument of just revolutionary hatred. What is revolutionary about hatred for Hemingway, I asked. I'm not talking about hatred for Hemingway. I'm talking about his work. I'm talking about their work. It was necessary to say out loud at, that last, at last that reading about Hemingway is a thousand times more amusing and instructive than reading Hemingway. It was necessary to show that Hemingway's work is but a coded form of Hemingway's life and that this life was just as poor and meaningless as all our lives. It was necessary to cut Mahler's symphony into little pieces and use it as background music for toilet paper ads. It was necessary at last to end the terror of the immortals, to overthrow the arrogant power of the Ninth Symphonies and the Fausts. Drunk on his own words, he got up and raised his glass high. I drink to the end of the old days. <laughs> 